Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to CMC Markets Non-Farm Payrolls webinar on Friday, the 6th of March. And I can't remember the last time I hosted one of these webinars where the actual US employment report couldn't be of lesser importance than it is right now. Before I get started, um, go general risk warning. Um, but um, I think irrespective of how good or bad today's payrolls report is, it's unlikely, I think, to really make that much difference to what markets do this afternoon or what markets do next week. It's really all about coronavirus. So um, rather than calling this the non-farm payrolls report for the US and the Canadian employment report, Let's just call it the coronavirus webinar because I have a feeling we'll probably be talking about that and not much else. Um, first and foremost, obviously, there's this week's emergency Fed rate cut, which to all intents and purposes was, I think, a little bit of an own goal on the part of the Federal Reserve because I think if they wanted to send a message to the markets that um, they were a little bit concerned about the coronavirus and its impact on growth going forward, they wouldn't have done an emergency rate cut and would probably have only done 25 basis points when they meet in March. Looking at the beige book earlier this week, there were 48 mentions of the coronavirus, which suggested that there are rising concerns about it, but certainly not enough to really, I think, worry people and duly, and let's not, you know, let's make no mistake about it, there will be effects from it. But I think in reacting the way that they did, I think they miscalculated quite badly because what they did was they sent a message to markets that they were worried and very, very worried about what might happen over the course of the next few months. And I think for me, it was the equivalent of the central bank trying to throw a treble 20 in darts and getting 180 and instead of instead of that throwing triple one and getting nine instead um, it missed the mark by quite some distance because we are now lower than when the Fed cut rates earlier this week and we're testing the lows of the recent range so let's talk about the payrolls um, we'll talk about the numbers but I'm going to move swiftly on because I think for me what you guys will want to see is chart points and chart points specifically, you know, where are the next key levels for stocks? In some cases, like the DAX, for example, we've already fallen through the lows of earlier this year. And that suggests to me that we're probably going to see further declines there. We're right on the lows of the FTSE 100 right now. Um, but talking about payrolls, February payrolls expecting to see 175,000 new jobs added down from the 225,000 that we saw in January. We did see also a hefty revision in the ADP payrolls report for January. That was revised down from 291 to 209, if memory serves me correctly. I'm trying to remember that off the top of my head, and I think it's 291 to 209. And the ADP number wasn't particularly bad either. Um, unemployment expected to come in around about 3.6%. Again, near a 50-year low, and the wages numbers are expected to remain in and around the 3% level. But let's start with the DAX, the Germany 30, while I continue to talk about the data with respect to the US economy, because so far what we've seen from the ISM reports is manufacturing still looks fairly decent. Well, so it looks fairly decent. It's rebounded in the last couple of months. But more importantly than that, non-manufacturing ISM was actually very, very good in all of the metrics, not just the headline number, but apart from prices paid, which was around about the 50 level, um, employment, um, new orders and what have you, all in the mid-50s. So the US economy services sector um, still shows, is still showing to be remarkably resilient. Um, so really I think it's about it's not about it's not about today's payrolls report what it's about 
I think in terms of the US labor market, it's what's coming down the pipe. And I think the best benchmark for the health of the US labor market will be the weekly jobless claims numbers. Now, they're currently coming in around about 215, 220. And I think if we start to see stresses in the US labor market, that's where we'll see them first. We'll see them in slowly rising jobless claims. But only if we move, I think, above 250,000, because we've sort of been trading between 200 and 240 over the course of the past few months in any case. So, you know, and even when, even when they had the GM strike, weekly jobless claims didn't really jump that much at the end of last year. So this, this coronavirus effect could take a while to filter down into the US economy. But, to, you know, judging by the Fed's actions, you'd think they were about to price in um, a significant slowdown in the US economy. Now, that could happen. That could happen. Markets are already pricing it in. If we look at, say, for example, the US 10-year yield, uh, I mean, I've, I've never seen a, a move like that in the US 10-year yields. We closed the end of last week on the US 10-year at 1.1486. We are now just above 71 basis points. So that is a hefty old move. That is a real hefty old move for US yields. And, you know, in and around 71.80 from all the way up here. I mean, that's pricing in a pretty drastic slowdown for the US economy. So th I think the question that we have to ask ourselves, is the market pricing in too much? The market's pricing in another 50 basis points from the Fed on the 18th of March. Is that realistic? Um, is that the message the Fed wants to send to what essentially is not only a supply shock, but a demand shock. What can lower rates do to offset the effects of a potential pandemic? I would argue there's not much they can do at all. And really what needs to happen is something on the fiscal side, but also um, in terms of the liquidity side. Now, you know, liquidity and rates, you know, don't have to work in lockstep with each other. Rates are already at historically very, very low levels. So you don't really need to lower rates to improve liquidity. But that's essentially what the Federal Reserve is expecting one to do. So not only is it basically pushing yields lower and placing enormous strain on bank balance sheets, as we're seeing, as, as we've seen today, in the European banking sector where the European bank's stock index is back at levels that we last saw at the height of the Eurozone debt crisis. If we look at this Bloomberg chart here, that gives you an indication. European banking stocks, they've absolutely cratered since the end, since the week ending the 21st of February. And back at levels, if I do a max chart on this, you can see that the last time they were this low it was all the way back in 2012. This is a quarterly chart, so it's probably not a particularly decent um, example. But if we, let's say, for example, go over the last 15 years on a monthly chart, they, the only time they were, they've been this low was back in the, uh, the depths of the Eurozone debt crisis when... Mario Draghi basically uttered those immortal words that he do whatever it takes to preserve the euro and believe me it will be enough. Now we're pretty much back there um, where we were in July 2012 and the prognosis is not looking particularly positive and this presents an enormous problem for the European Central Bank. Huge problem for the ECB because the markets are pricing in ever lower rates and ever lower rates is utterly, utterly toxic for the European banking sector, utterly toxic. There's absolutely no upside if they want the banks to help out with smoothing out cash flow um, problems for companies in the euro area. And that's essentially what, um, th that's essentially what the economy needs. There's going to be an awful lot of what I would call cash flow spikes if we get a significant um, slowdown in the global economy over the course of the next few weeks and months. And what an awful lot of companies will need is forbearance um, or sympathy in terms of 
getting over these cash flow humps. So if the ECB doesn't deliver something like that next week, then the situation in the euro area could get very bad very, very quickly. We're already seeing it borne out in the DAX. If we look at the DAX chart here, we can see on this chart, I drew some Fibonacci retracement levels on this for you. We rebounded off the 61.8 Fibonacci retracement level of the entire up move from the lows that we saw in December, the end of, the end of December, January 18, beginning of 19. Um, and, um, and the highs earlier this year. And we rebounded off the 61.8 Fibonacci retracement level. And we've now broken below that. Now that is significant. We need to close below that to signal a retest of these lows here in and around 11,200. Um, and that, that suggests to me here that we've got a little bit of a flag. This is a classic this is a classic thrust move down here, a little bit of a flag and then another thrust move lower. So on that basis, the fact that we've broken lower here on a technical basis is a very, very bad sign. If we close back above 11,700 on the DAX, then we've had a false breakout. So if you're looking to trade this break lower, then any stop loss needs to be back above this retracement line here. I'm just being asked if um, there's an audio problem on the part of um, people who are hearing me. Someone's saying they can't hear any audio. Um, I think that if there wasn't any audio, I'd have more than one person um, basically saying that they couldn't hear me. So um, anyone who has audio problems, check your speakers or headphones and hopefully the problem will go away. So just give me a second in with audio problems. Please check speakers, etc. I'll just send that to everybody. So um, okay, so we've we've seen a break lower in the DAX. Now the big question now is will we see a significantly similar move elsewhere? We're also at a very key level on the on the FTSE one hundred. And I'm just going to outline that for you here. Here we go. Let's try that again. 64.60 on the FTSE was the lows that we saw earlier this month. And we're retesting that right now. So on a technical basis, in terms of the FTSE, let's not forget the FTSE is underperformed on the way up and it generally tends to underperform on the way down. Um, if we break below this low here then there's a good chance we could go quite a bit lower personally um you know i think in terms of the FTSE 100 uk stocks and what have you the sell-off is slightly overdone the problem with the FTSE is sort of gauging where the next support level will go if we break below 64.50 which is basically this low here at the end of february 64.55 i've got as a low so what i'm going to do with this one ladies and gentlemen is basically extrapolate out if to where the next support level is um, with respect to the weekly chart. So we've got the weekly chart here. Um, we can see that there is a nice little low in and around there. But we've also got this low here back here. And we've also got a series of highs through here. So between 6400 and 6420 um, is a fairly decent area of support. So even if we break below 6450, I'm not overly convinced that we're probably going to move much below 6400 in any case. You know, I, I can't I can't buy into the case that if we if we if we break 6450, we'll come crashing off, given how big a support and resistance area this this region has been. Um, since 2015, 2016, 2017. So certainly keep an eye on this level, but I'm minded to think that in the short term we could see a little bit of a base on the FTSE 100 between 64.20 and, and, 60 and, the, and these sorts of levels that, that we've got here. If we look at the S&P 500, we're, al we're, not, we're almost there with respect to the numbers. So as I say, not expecting a significant reaction. 
we're well short at the moment on the S&P of the 50% retracement of the entire up move here, which is at 28.58. So again, I think any downside on equity markets while these series of support level holds could well be limited. Now, that's not to say that we can't go lower, but I think ahead of the weekend, it's unlikely that people will want to take on significant amounts of new risk heading into the weekend and take out the lows that we saw um, earlier this year. Global, global coronavirus cases confirmed surpassed 100,000. Yeah, that's cases reported, and that's a lot. But, um, you know, for, for me, that, that number's only likely to go higher. And really, it's just a question of the economic disruption it's likely to cause. But if we look at this 2855 level on the, foot, uh, on the s and it's a big level because it also corresponds with the October 2019 low. So that's huge. It's a huge level, huge support level. And if we get down there, then I think it stands to reason we could see a decent rebound. Now, let's look at the dollar and euro dollar in particular. I still think there's, I think there's potential further upside in euro dollar. Why do I think that? Because I don't think the S&P, sorry, the S&P, the ECB can do um, that much and will be able to do that much next year on the rates front. Whereas the Federal Reserve has certainly got more scope to ease further, which means that the upside on euro dollar is likely to give us a retest of these highs here at 114.12, 114.20 in the highs at the end in the middle part of next year. So I'm thinking that we're potentially going to get further dollar weakness over the course of the next few days and weeks. That's not to say that we're going to get there today. Um, in terms of gold prices, very, very quickly, I think we can go to 1800 by year end um, fa fairly easily if this coronavirus stuff um, continues the way that it has been. Looking at dollar yen, dollar yen looks very, very weak and the likelihood is we're probably going to retest the lows that we saw a few, uh, few weeks ago, a few months ago in August of 104.45, 104.50. We're only about 50, 50, 60 points away from that. It's unlikely that we'll break below that in the short to medium term. So let's get ready for the Canadian payrolls and the US payrolls report. And the numbers are out. And 273, that's a fairly decent number for February payrolls, very dollar positive number. So that should give us a bit of a knee jerk reaction when it comes to the dollar, a little bit of a rebound there. But overall, it really doesn't change the picture that much. Canadian payrolls report, again, a fairly decent number there on the Canadian payrolls. Wage growth, 3% US. And the unemployment rates fall into 3.5, so it's a 50 year low. So all told, all told, ladies and gentlemen, a fairly decent set of numbers, none of which matters. But having said that, it will still give us, I think, a fairly decent opportunity to rally for stock markets. And I think it's sort of a little bit of a little bit of a silver lining in a week which has been absolutely horrible for risk. So. So in terms of the overall direction of the dollar, we're probably not going to see an awful lot in terms of the declines thus far. But nonetheless, it should cap, it should limit cap, should limit the downside in the short to medium term. We've seen some big moves this week in US Treasuries. We've seen some big moves this week in equities and we've seen some big moves this week in the US dollar. So I think, you know, we should get a decent, we should get a fairly we should get some sort of rebound on the back of these numbers. And we're already starting to see that now. The FTSE 100 is at 64.80. It was around about 64.67, 64.68. Um, the the S&P is in and around 2.933 um, and is starting to tick back up as well. So again, you know, a fairly decent set of numbers, but overall, um, doesn't change the overall long-term picture for, 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 for dollar weakness, but I think it will limit the downside for today. Now, does anyone have any questions um, before I start to move on and look ahead to what's coming up next week? Because there's three things I'm paying particular interest to over the course of the next few days. China trade. Um... ECB and the UK budget and I think for me when we're looking when we're looking at markets 
through those multiple prisms and you're looking at the pound in particular I think there's a good case to make that I think there's potentially further upside for sterling than there is for the euro now why do I say that well basically we've got a budget next week and the UK government has much more fiscal flexibility to take steps to mitigate the effects of coronavirus than any other country in the European Union. Why? Because it controls its own budget and it controls its own currency. So if it wants to go on a fiscal splurge, it can. Um, and in essence, that could well actually help underpin the pound going forward. So I think for me, particularly in the context of the ECB meeting next week and the UK budget next week, Euro sterling is a fairly decent Euro sterling is a fairly decent cross to have a view on. Um, earlier this week, Euro sterling, please feel free to fire any questions my way if you want me to cover anything in particular, if you want me to focus much more on the payrolls, because I know this is an on-farm payrolls webinar, but I don't really think there's anything else much left to say on that. Um, looking at this Euro sterling chart, we've got the 200 day moving average, which has capped the advance of the euro over the course of the past few days at 87.45, 87.50. So playing, a, playing the euro sterling, I would certainly look to start to think about playing this from the short side um, if we get close to or near to this week's highs. Um, I certainly think there's a case that the there's potential for the pound to go higher and the euro to come lower. And I know we can talk about the trade talks and everything else between the, U the EU and the UK, but so much of that is political. So much of that is political. And it's political noise. And it doesn't really tell us where we're going to be at the end of this year. It only tells us where we are now. And the transition period ends at the end of this year. So it's not really going to drive the dynamics in terms of euro sterling between now and then. So for me, I always trade things from technical points, technical standpoints. And in markets like this, which are moving 3 4% in a day, it's never been more important that you pick your levels when you're trading. So if you're looking to go long, you're looking to go short, don't just dive in. Look at the chart, identify your key levels as to where to go long or short and then set your stop loss accordingly the worst thing you can do in a market like this is just dive straight in because you can get stopped out on a whip very very easily and when you're seeing thousand point moves in the dow and you're seeing 70 or 80 point moves in the s p 500 it's very very easy to get sucked in very very easy to get sucked in so first rule of trading as far as i'm concerned is trade the levels, pick the levels that you're comfortable getting in at and then trade around that. So in terms of this euro sterling trade, um, you want to try and make the distance between your entry level and your stop loss level as small as possible without obviously putting it too close. So if you've got a stop loss above 87.50, that's probably a little bit too close, but if you've got a stop loss at 87.70 on euro sterling um, for a short position, that's probably just about right. And any pullback is likely to find support in and around this 86 level here, which basically coincides with a series of highs there, there, and there. I work on the basis that when resistance breaks, it becomes support, and when support breaks, it becomes resistance. The, the trick is when you're trading is to keep your losses small and run your profits. So you want to make the losses that you take as small as possible. So in terms of playing euro sterling from the short side, you can clearly define where your stop loss is because it's above the 200 day moving average. And it's also um, above the highs of the last five days. So you clearly defined your risk parameters straight away. And then from that, you can then extrapolate how much money you're looking to make on the on the upside. So if you're risking 50 points on the downside, you can look to try and make 100 on the upside. That's 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 the rule of thumb generally. Um, do I use average true range? No, I don't. Um, 
you can usually tell whether a market's trending or ranging just by looking at it. You don't need an ATR to tell you that. Um, but it's you know that's just my own personal preference. I'm not rubbishing it. It works for some people. It doesn't work for others. Um, so I've just been I've just been asked about crude oil. So let's look at crude oil because that's gone for a little bit of a slide today. As those of you who follow me on Twitter will know, um, went for a little bit of a little bit of a crash um, because Russia has decided that it does not want to take part in any production cuts before June. And that's caused a little bit of a sell off because of fears of a slowdown in demand um, will bring about a bit of a supply surplus. So we've seen a little bit of a sell off down here. We've broken below um, the lows that we saw earlier this month. So at the moment, we've really got to determine where we go from here. And this is the hardest thing with crude oil, and this is why I really don't like getting involved with it. Because for me, it's something that I always end up getting stopped out on because I don't really know enough about the trading yet. First and foremost, I've always been a currency trader. I traded FX on, a, on, a, on an Australian bank spot desk um, in the 1990s, and that is basically what I'm familiar with. That's my comfort zone, if you like. It's where I feel most comfortable, trading spot for an exchange. Having said that, using technical analysis and charts, um, the rules generally tend to apply pretty much across asset class. So um, as long as you maintain your discipline and you wait for the market to come to you, then generally you can mitigate any downside risk. And you will. You will take losses. Everybody does. I do. The trick is to basically keep your losses to a minimum. You know, and I think that's really the key thing when it comes to trying to figure out um, you know, where, where, where your entry and exit points are likely to be. If we, if we look along here, we can see that it's very, very difficult to determine where the next key support is on Brent crude, apart from these lows back in 2017, when we were around about $45 a barrel. And I'll be very surprised if OPEC allows prices to fall that low um, without cutting production further. And I think the reason Russia is resistant to cutting output is because they're actually doing very nicely, thank you, because of the strength of the ruble and the weakness of the dollar. So when they convert their dollars back into rubles, they're actually not taking such a big hit as, say, for example, the Middle Eastern countries are. Um, and that's why they're trying. That's why they're playing hardball uh, when it comes to um, cutting production further. It's not in their interests to sort of do their um, Middle Eastern neighbours too much of a favour. So they want to try and extract as many concessions as possible out of them. Assuming, of course, both sides um, conform to their quotas. And generally, with OPEC production cuts, um, there's usually a little bit of swerving going on when it comes to um, compliance, shall we say. Anyway, so we're at the bottom end of the range, I think, on uh, WTI and Brent at the moment. Um, and if we look at WTI in, w WTI in particular, we actually haven't made new lows, which makes me a little bit suspicious about whether or not there's any further downside in crude oil in the short to medium term. If we look at this candle here, this big strong candle here on WTI, there's a decent low there of around about $43 a barrel. So I would be very, very reluctant to be short at these sorts of levels at this point in time and particularly ahead of the weekend and particularly when OPEC um, and OPEC plus are still meeting. It's um, a very dangerous thing to do to run a position like that over the weekend. It's not something that I'm a particular fan of, particularly in these markets, because just so many different things can happen over weekends now that usually it's just a license to sort of lose money or get stopped out. So. Um, in terms of crude oil, I think we're probably potentially near the lows in the short term. Obviously, if we break the lows, then I'll have to reassess that point of view. Um, any other questions, uh, ladies and gents, before I move on? Looking at the dollar CAD after that decent Canadian payrolls report, sort of gives the lie to the 50 basis point rate cut from the Bank of Canada, doesn't it, really? 
Um, again, you know, I think central banks have overreacted. I think they've fired a blank. They've acted unnecessarily and they're using the wrong tools. But what I would say is the Federal Reserve have got the flexibility um, to step in as of the Bank of England funding for lending or a special lending program, special liquidity scheme. Um, they've done that before. We could see that in the budget next week. And I think that could be fairly supportive of sterling going forward. Um, let's, have a let's have a quick look at the cable actually, because I think um, that's at a very, very key level at this point in time. And it's something that I tend to update on a fairly regular basis. And if we look at uh, cable here, we've broken the downtrend line from the Boris bounce highs in December 135. We're now looking to move above the 50 day moving average. We found decent support in and around the 200 day moving average or 127 and a half. And I certainly think there's, 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 there's definitely potential for us over the course of the next week or so to move back to here, 132, and potentially edge a little bit higher over the course of the next few days and weeks. Um, simply because I think the flexibility of the Bank of England is likely to mean that Euro sterling is likely to drift lower. Um, assuming, of course, Euro sterling stays below its 200 day moving average. If, however, Euro sterling moves above its 200 day moving average, you have to revise all of your assumptions about sterling weakness and sterling strength. Because I, der I derive an awful lot of my assumptions about sterling on the basis of what Euro sterling is doing relative to Euro dollar. So at the moment, Euro sterling's just gone slightly better bid, and that's pushing the pound back down from the 50 day moving average. So, you know, as a spot trader, you do have to be aware of the cross currents of the crosses and how they affect the pound against the dollar. Just been asked about Euro Swiss. Obviously, there's definitely a safe haven play going on there. We've just gone below 106. Um, if stock markets start to rally, you'll probably start to see Euro Swiss start to edge back up again. But certainly, I think in terms of the direction of travel here, we're in very much sell the rally mode. Um, the trend is definitely down. I would, I would certainly be looking for Euro Swiss to sell any strength back to 108. Again, not a big fan of selling at the lows. Um, I'm very much a momentum trader, but I don't like selling at the bottom. And I certainly don't like buying at the top. But I like selling into strength in a downtrend and buying into weakness in an uptrend. But I'm not a big fan of jumping on the back of a move because so many times when I was trading spot, I tried to do that. And I usually ended up wearing them for the next three or four hours. And while I was able to probably get out of them, it was an uncomfortable three or four hours before I was able to. So it's very much about trading on the levels and trying to remove as much of the emotion from it as possible. You can save the emotion for when you take your profit or obviously when you take your stop losses, then you can let the emotion out. But other than that, you need to be you need to be fairly dispassionate when it comes to trading because it is a very emotive pastime. Um, I've got enough grey hairs to prove it. Anything else, ladies and gents? Let's quickly look at gold because I know I talked about it, but we didn't look at it. So let's look at it. There we go. So here's gold again. We've tried to move above the highs that we saw in February. We haven't really been able to follow through on them. Um, but overall, the trend is very clear there. We're still looking for a move higher. I just don't think we're going to get it yet. Certainly not by the end of this week. I um, think there's scope for gold prices to drift back. But I'm still of the opinion um, that we'll see $1,800 an ounce by the end of this year. Um, simply on the basis that if this um, if this uh, if this corona this coronavirus thing is not over by any stretch of the imagination, it's not going to just blow over. It's going to take centre stage for quite some time. 
and you're going to get an awful lot of companies start to blame coronavirus for their woes and an awful lot of those companies will have you know will have decent reason to do so but it's also likely to become the new brexit in terms of companies making excuses for not hitting their revenue targets or not hitting their profit targets and to all intents and purposes a lot of a lot of that for say for example like airlines hotels some retailers um, that will be justified but for other businesses not directly connected it probably won't be um, you know the collapse of fly b earlier this week wasn't directly related to coronavirus it was part and parcel of it but the company was in pretty ropey shape even before that so the coronavirus was basically the straw that broke the camel's back but if you're looking at other airlines then you have to look at the ones with the strongest balance sheet and at the moment everyone's getting absolutely battered out of sight um, but you know a weaker weaker airline would be somewhere like Norwegian for example that's taken an absolute hosing in the past few weeks hotels have taken an absolute hosing in the past few weeks so again you know it's very much a case of when everything comes crashing off everything gets sold off even the good ones um, just been asked to look at euro dollar um, again I think the upside is fairly limited on that um, we could go to 114 I think it's but I think that's probably the upper limit on euro dollar if we look at this chart here let me just blow it out so it's a weekly chart and then you can see, see slightly more detail on it um, to give you a better idea of where we are so we've come down from 126 in 2018 and for the best part of the last 12 months it's been like watching paint dry but in the past two weeks we've gone from 108 and look to be heading back to 114 I think it's going to be very very difficult for euro dollar to trade much above where we are now so we've got this series of highs through here but we've also got the 200 week moving average so 114 is likely to be a bit of a barrier on euro dollar and um, I think it's I think it's going to be very very difficult for euro dollar to get back above 114.20 very difficult indeed it might do it eventually um, but overall the ECB does not want euro dollar up at 114 it's deflationary it will not cause them to hit their inflation target and will make things that much more difficult to hit their inflation target so um, in terms of in terms of 119 I just cannot see it not at this point in time if we break 114.20 conclusively then yeah absolutely but you know once once we break key chart points um, and the direction changes you know we look at the lows we look at the highs it's definitely in a downtrend until we break this downtrend euro dollars not going to 119 not any not any time soon not unless the bottom falls out of the US economy and even if the bottom does fall out of the US economy it's still going to be in better shape than the European economy particularly in uh, the European banking sector so the European banking sector is the real flashpoint for me in terms of um, where the weaknesses lie and that's where I think we may need to pay particular attention to with respect to the European Central Bank meeting on Thursday so I do think I do think gold will push up but gold is very much by the dips don't buy it here but if we get a pullback to sixteen hundred dollars an ounce or sixteen twenty then I'm on, then I'm a buyer of gold if we drop below fifteen fifteen fifty then all bets are off but I think gold will push up yes definitely think will gold gold will I think gold will be eighteen hundred dollars by the end of the year I got asked will we get negative interest rates in the US no I don't think we will um, I don't think the way for US financial markets work um, mean that it, that will ever happen so no I do not think that we will get negative interest rates in the US um, let me see any other questions that I may have missed out I think that's it okay okay so ladies and gentlemen I think that's pretty much it for this week can I check silver yes of course I can check silver um, 
you're brave if you're trading silver because that's an industrial metal as well as a precious metal. So that's going to get pulled in either direction. If there's, a, if there's an economic slowdown, it'll get hit. But if you've got a weaker dollar, it should find some area of support. At the moment, it's lagging significantly behind um, gold. And it's very much in a range. So if I look at this silver chart, I can see that it's pretty much a buy anywhere near $16.50. And it's a sell anywhere near 19 And essentially, that's the way I would play that particular trade. Based on the price action of the past six months, it's very much a range trade in terms of um, trading silver. And those of you who want to follow me on Twitter, my Twitter handle is at mhewson, M-H-E-W-S-O-N underscore C-M-C. Otherwise, I'd like to thank you all for turning up to this webinar. I hope you found it um, instructive. Please leave some positive feedback if you could. And I hope you all have a great weekend. And thank you very much for listening.